Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. This week, we're honored to have David Meeson, the founder and owner of Meeson Consulting. He's a certified love coach, dating coach, specifically for men. So he helps men find and attract the right partner. He's blown up online. He has over 500,000 subscribers on TikTok, hundreds of thousands on Instagram, and he's helped many, many men find and attract the right person. And today we all know how hard that is. Dating is the, you know, David, we we're just talking offline. Dating is the number one topic. And I'm so excited to have you on the show to share your work with the audience, man. Thank you so much for having me. So, so David, you know, the, how did you get started in the space, man? I know a little bit about your story. Do you mind sharing it with the audience? Sure. So a lot of the clients that I work with are introverts. I would say 80%. I was always extroverted. So I was confident in general because largely I was training martial arts from an early age on. But just because you're extroverted, that doesn't necessarily help you with women. Because you can be confident in a lot of areas, be that a business and martial arts, but when there's a beautiful woman inside out standing in front of you, you, exhi you exhibit certain subcommunications, non-verbal, that make you come across not as the most attractive version of yourself. So I wasn't really good at it. My father, probably one of the most intelligent people I know, didn't have a great relationship with my mother either. They just weren't compatible, they weren't happy, so I didn't have a role model. So long story short, I eventually end up marrying somebody who wasn't right for me because, you know, out of a lack of options. Most of us get into the relationship, most men get into relationships with women because they're just kind of there. You know, just social circle, they meet them randomly, and since they don't have a lot of high quality options available to choose somebody, they're just like, well, yeah, cool, you know? And then you don't really evaluate whether you're compatible on your core values, on the way you want to live life, and a variety of different other things. And then I ended up in a relationship that was, wasn't great. Now, she was a good person at heart. She still is. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but we just weren't compatible. There were a lot of values where we weren't aligned. And I basically just didn't really feel desired in that relationship. I felt like my existence was tolerated, and I believe that's what most men go through. M women have their own story, 100%. There's plenty of women who are being treated terribly by men in relationships. So we as human beings, we do a lot of suffering onto each other. But a lot of men also experience that, which isn't talked about enough. That Who said that? Henry David, Henry David Thoreau or somebody? That most men live lives of quiet desperation, especially in relationships where they're being tolerated. I'd come home and she says, oh, the dish is done, oh, nice to meet you, as opposed to actually feeling desired. And so that was pretty rough. But eventually I, feel free to interrupt me because I can ramble on for quite a while. Keep going, keep going. Um, but I believe God, the universe, life, whatever you believe in or don't believe in, gives you second chances. So while I was married to her, pretty, pretty unhappy, I was working for a big tech company in Dublin at the time, and there was a guy who ended up sitting next to me in this big office who got a job there one month after me, who was into this dating, attraction, and seduction space for many years at the time. He could have been a coach himself if he wanted to, but he's just not as much of an attention hoe as I am. <laughs> so uh, he, uh, he's like, you know, he's a, he's a nerd still to this day, but he just had ex excellent communication skills. And so I realized we once went to a team event, just the 10 of us from our, ten, from our little team in a pub in Ireland. And we were just in this pub and there's a bunch of other people and I just see him walk over to two random women. And they start talking, they start laughing, he comes back and shows me their Instagram and I ask him, how did you know her? How do, where do you know her from? He says, no, no, I just approached her. I said, what? You just randomly approached somebody, they laughed, they were so reactive, so positively, and now you have her Instagram, oh, you can learn this, you know? Because if you grow up a ginger in Western society, you're not necessarily considered the pinnacle of male attractiveness. <laughs> and so I realized that mofo got a skill set that I don't have. And so I really liked him. So basically he became a mentor of mine. Well, at the time I was still married to my ex-wife and even when I realized that I wanted to get out of that relationship, it still took me months to be able to make that decision. Talking to a therapist, talking to friends, talking to family members, because you don't want to hurt the person. I believe for most men who are not complete narcissists or psychopaths, probably one of the worst things is seeing our mother cry, so we don't really want to make women feel bad. So this idea of hurting her that badly was really terrifying to me. So eventually we ended it. It wasn't nearly as bad for her as I originally anticipated. And so it was still difficult. 
So once I got out of that, I started going out with him and he started teaching me, okay, well, this is how you introduce yourself. This is how you do online dating because I'm German. I can get quite stuck in my head. I'm in a pub in Dublin in a Latin bar, for example, and I'm talking to girls about IT infrastructure and they're like, hey, can you be a little bit more fun and playful, you know? So I was quite in my head, but he started showing me things and around, because I never had that swag with women. I was never cool. You know, you can be extroverted, but I've had friends. I grew up around of like Turkish friends in Germany and... Most of them were a lot cooler than me. They got the swag, you know, and they call it Riz these days, <laughs> what a game, whatever you want to call it. I didn't have that. But then after around four weeks or so, I'm in this pub talking to this Spanish lady and I must have ignored all of her signals for 15 or 20 minutes because eventually she asks me, are you going to kiss me or not? And so we start making out. And that was the first time ever I kissed somebody the same day I met her, which was crazy to me. Because up until that point, I thought, okay, oh, can I use curse words or shouldn't I? Yeah, you're fine. Man. Okay, I thought it was only the fuck boys who do that. I was like, okay, it's only the guys who are cool, they can do that. It's like, oh, little ginger me, I can, I can learn that? And it was like, this was a moment of freedom because it wasn't about the kiss in and of itself, but about the fact that you can actually learn to create a connection out of nothingness. That's the amazing thing. And so from that point on, I just started going out all the time, got a ridiculous amount of experience over the years, learned from not just my initial mentor, but people in the relationship space, dating space, psychologists in Germany, psychotherapists, I'm not one, but I learned a lot from them because I wanted to find a very well-rounded approach because I realized most people get their dating or relationship advice either from the mainstream, which is just be yourself, just be a good listener, be a kind and nice guy. And yes, you should be a nice guy. You should be really kind. You should be a good listener. You should be yourself. But telling somebody to just be yourself it's the same thing as saying, just be rich. Yeah, I agree, but how? You know, what am I gonna do? How? So that is definitely necessary, but not sufficient. But on the other hand, you have extreme, on the other side of the spectrum, you have extreme pickup artistry, which is a lot of lying, manipulation, and deception, right? And I'm not saying that there aren't other dating coaches who aren't great. There's a lot of other people who I respect, who I think were the best in the world. Yeah, I kind of have to. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's like, there's other people who I respect, but there's a couple of approaches in terms of where you lie, where the ultimate goal is just to have sex with as many women as possible, that's just not fulfilling. And I feel like if you have to lie, manipulate and cheat, yes, you can get temporary sex, but you're never gonna be able to have a true relationship on eye level because if you, like, trust is broken immediately. How can you build on that? So over the years, we've developed an approach that understands, yes, it has to be a relationship on eye level, it has to be based in kindness, but there are also some relationship dynamics that are not politically correct because how we and men and women relate to one another isn't always PC because there's parts of our biology that are much deeper ingrained than the social conditioning that's been imposed upon us over the last 50 or 100 years. And so I always loved coaching. I was coaching uh, karate at my university here in Ireland at Maynooth University. Men and women, I enjoyed that. Always really liked that. And then eventually I just started working with men and help now almost men from 30 different countries find someone get a better social life meet more high quality male friends as well and for me it's a fucking awesome journey because i i really like it it's something that i truly truly enjoy um there's aspects to every job like the administrative side of things that may not be that much fun but the actual being with people helping them on that journey is something that's really, really meaningful for me because not only is dating fun and you can have a lot of fun conversations with really intelligent, ambitious and successful men that you otherwise wouldn't have, but I've really also seen the dark night of the soul, as I said, I really suffered a lot. There were times where I had panic attack. I had a panic attack the day after my wedding, right? Wow. No, it was serious. Like I was after the wedding with my ex-wife because I was ignoring the parts in me that were telling me that I shouldn't be doing this. I was so stressed beforehand but I was so afraid of losing her. I was like, I'll never find someone like her. I don't want to lose her, but I stuffed them down because I was like, if I don't marry her, well, then that's it. That wasn't an explicit threat, but that was what was happening. And she was more grounded. I was in a country, I didn't have my family with me. So I was dependent more on her for love and connection. And so the day after the wedding, we're having a celebration at her parents' house. And after that, I drive my mother, my brother, and his girlfriend at the time, in my girlfriend's mother's car back to the hotel and at the party we had salmon and I, <clears throat> I started feeling my throat and I was like oh maybe there was something with the, with the with the salmon and anybody who's ever had anxiety or panic attack you take some stimulus that's slightly out of order your nervous system your brain starts looking for something that could be wrong and then you pop 
bam, you fixate on it. It may be a pain somewhere. Oh, I'm having a heart attack. Not saying that you have something that you shouldn't get checked. But this is how people end up in the ER oftentimes because they, they think there's something wrong with them. So I thought that was that. I was like, I think I can't breathe. And so we pull the car over. I call an ambulance. They check me. They say your airwaves, airways are perfect, but your whatever, whatever they measure, so you just have a shit ton of anxiety, my friend. And I said, oh, okay. And then I basically just still suffered away for a couple of weeks, went on a honeymoon with my ex-wife. And I've never told this story publicly, but back then during the honeymoon, I was so, I had so much anxiety in my head that I basically, we were in San Francisco at the time. I contacted a psychotherapist in Ireland from my honeymoon. Wow. And then I got back to Ireland, started going to that psychotherapy, then met my mentor. And that's kind of, these two things happened at the same time. So I did something called EMDR therapy. If anybody struggles with anxiety, it's amazing. It's one of the very few tools that are actually proven to help with PTSD and anxiety and depression. I was never depressed. I believe we as human beings, not I believe, I believe that's the science, that there are three main negative emotions. Anger, depression, or anxiety. Tony Robbins says we all have a favorite flavor of suffering. For me, it was anxiety. And so that helped a ton to just relax. I started working. I met a mentor of mine. So there's a lot of shifts that happened. It wasn't just one thing. And so that's kind of how that whole thing evolved. So the reason I care is I've experienced what it's like to be with somebody who isn't right for you. And there's nothing wrong about her as a person. She's not a bad person at all. You know, there's difficulties and things you can critique about everybody. But there are definitely moments where I questioned my, my own well-being. It's like, what's going on inside of me? Because if you don't have anybody to talk to, and a lot of men, like some men kill themselves, a lot of men suffer away from many years. Women as well. I don't want to take away from the suffering they experience, for sure. But... So on the one hand, dating is really fun, but it's also very meaningful because for me, it's not just about the outcome of helping somebody be in a relationship. You're supposed to be in a relationship with a person who's right for you and your own freedom of expression. You need to be able to communicate your needs. So I feel like I'm very fortunate because Fernanda and I, we get invited to weddings, babies are being born. There's a totally new degree of freedom that comes with that men then approach their dating and their relationship life with. And in turn, women benefit as well, because if men are more peaceful and can more peacefully communicate what's going on inside of them, and more honestly, I think everybody benefits from that. Yeah, there's so much, by the way, thanks for sharing. There's so much there, you know, I think you're right, men, we tend to restrict and not communicate and express ourselves in a way that women can understand. Women are, you know, women have been complaining a lot about men today. And I want to say complain, like men just, the dating options now, a lot of guys have given up on dating, a lot of women have given up on dating, mm -hmm. particularly, you know, 20 to 40. And as you talk to women, women are frustrated with men. They don't think men know how to approach them. They don't know how men know how to be in relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's caused a lot of friction. And it kind of ties down to a lot of what you were saying too, is, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening in society today, you know, modern versus old dating, like all those things that play into the way men approach women. But it's interesting for you because you, you were actually an introvert at some point, and then you learned how to approach women. Can you talk I, about I was, that, that transition? I was always extroverted, but I was bad with women. I was shy in front of them. I wasn't, I was extroverted, but I wasn't able to communicate in a way that was attractive to them. So mm -hmm. what's attractive to women? So how do you communicate yeah. in a way to women where women feel heard, special, all yeah. those things that they like. Yeah, there's a lot of different things. So I think one, women want men who are kind and generous, that's fine. But women also want a man who can show them, not directly outright say, but show them that he doesn't care whether this particular interaction succeeds or not. She has to feel that you don't give a shit whether it works or not. It's just a fact of life. Now, that doesn't mean that you get to be a psychopath or that you get to be disrespectful. No, you're gonna be respectful, you're gonna be kind, and you're going to invest. But this whole nice guy thing, let's maybe qualify this for people. Yes, you're supposed to be super nice and kind, but you have to communicate in a way, and I can give a couple of very practical examples in a minute yeah. on how to do that, that shows her that you don't mind. And one very practical example is just disagreeing. She tells you something and you just go, really? As opposed to most guys just go, oh yeah, right, oh yeah. You know this head nod that we do with more, that I, in normal conversation, yeah, because we're not trying to fuck each other. Yes, it's good. But having a little bit of disagreeableness of like, really? Oh, she's not used to men disagreeing even. 
Most men can't even disagree because they're worried that if they disagree, they'll lose their, uh, her attraction. But it's the exact opposite. Now, you're not supposed to disagree just for the sake of it as a technique. But when you genuinely agree, say, this is really awesome, boom, fist bump, or no, oh, that's complete nonsense. I completely disagree, you know, in a respectful way. Disagreeing is one way. Then talking about doing storytelling, because using storytelling is a very powerful tool where you can, because how is she gonna get to know things about you? There is studies that indicate that how attractive a woman perceives a man depends on what she knows about you. And what she knows about you depends on what you tell her. In other words, storytelling. Now, a story doesn't mean, need to be a Harry Potter book, but I went there, I visited my mother here, we did this, da, da, da. And then you put elements in there that make you look like an authentic and attractive version. And most men already, at least the ones that I work with, they are. They're kind people, they're doing well, they're ambitious. Everybody has their flaws. I have mine, you have yours. But they don't know how to talk about the things that make them come across attractive. They brag or they're insecure. You're not supposed to do either, right? You're supposed to confidently talk about what you're good at. You can even sometimes jokingly, I do this sometimes, even with Fernanda, it's like when I'm, I'm, when I'm on coaching calls with clients sometimes, every now and then I say something, I was like, wow, that was actually fucking genius. And I write it down and I make an Instagram quote about it. But I don't actually take myself to see, I'm just like making fun of it in a playful, cocky way. Because women like that. They like that. Not when you're like, well, I'm actually a genius. You know, I'm actually, I don't know if you know Pedro, but uh, blah, blah. you're like, oh, fucking dick, get the fuck out of here. You know, just nobody likes that. But if you do it in a bold, charming way where you can make fun of yourself, self-deprecation is a beautiful tool. Now, use too much, it makes you come across as insecure. Not used at all, you miss out on coming across in a very confident way. Because if you can make fun of yourself every now and then, it's the best way to show that you're confident. Making fun of yourself, self-deprecation is a beautiful tool. These, these are just a couple of examples. Oh, yeah, and I agree. You know, there's two things that you said there that makes you think, of, I'm single now, and when I go on dates with women, this is what I hear the most, and mm -hmm. it's exactly what you're saying, is men are not confident. There's a, a lack of yeah. confidence for men, and men either go all the way to their ego, where they're just trying to show off, and mm -hmm. it turns them off, or they're very meek, very scared, and just kind of going with the flow. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is a lot of guys take themselves too seriously. And mm -hmm. when you're on a date and you're talking to somebody, even like in a business, but just any type of relationship, the, if you're so serious and tense and you're taking yourself too serious, like it just creates an awkward environment. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of men have that because we as men in general, we like to be logical. When we do storytelling as men, we go from fact to fact to fact. Sequential event, sequential event, sequential event. Women, they talk about the emotions they ex they've experienced. So you need to communicate almost like a woman <laughs> to, to get her attracted. Not fully, you're still gonna be a man. But if you just talk about, what do we do? Oh yeah, so I went to the gym, then this happened, then you choked me out, then I went home, it was a great day, cool. Like, well, you choked me out, and then, you know, I felt a little bit sad because I've been training for a long time, and I didn't think it was gonna be this hard, and was, you know, I actually like getting choked. <laughs> you know? So you need to communicate more emotionally rather than just logically and sequentially, and you also wanna relate the story to you and her. If you tell a story, don't just go on a rant, relate the story to her. I bet you, you look like, you know, playful assumptions. It's a fun and playful game, not you against her, not you manipulating her, not you lying, with her. Having a fun and playful interaction with her. Do you believe in game? Like, should guys work on their game? Is there such thing as game? Yeah, so game just stands for communication, right? And it, words have a meaning and people, nowadays in our culture, so words get, we don't need to go into that, but you get the idea, like people, yeah, words are being used in different contexts and then there's a new meaning being ascribed to certain words. So some people in the pickup artistry community, they use game and it means communication. Game and, but it just means good communication skills, confidence. So there's only three things a man needs to be successful with women to find somebody. Communication skills, confidence, and understanding the dynamics. That's game, that's what you need. And anybody can develop that. Most of us just haven't had a role model who taught us that, but everybody can learn that. And it's important because the cool thing is, if you're a kind guy and you're ambitious, no matter how successful you are, I work with some people who are like hyper successful and some people who are just like normal good jobs, you know? And there's people who can't afford the program. That's why we put out a lot of content, right? Because I want to help two types of people. The ones who can be our clients, obviously, of course. But then I also genuinely want to make an impact with videos and long-form formats on YouTube. Because there's people, like I remember when I was a student, I had no money, right? And I, I needed some, some guidance. 
So yeah, everybody can develop that. And if you're a kind dude and you're ambitious, then just work on your communication skills, improve your confidence, and most importantly, take some action. Get out there, right? I would say more than 50% of my clients, I find somebody through online dating, theoretically, you never even have to do a cold approach as such. It's perfectly fine to just use online dating, but here's the thing. If you don't learn how to approach women, you will never have the same level of confidence. There is a level of confidence that comes from being able to start a potential relationship out of nothingness that you cannot fake. And 99.99% of men can't do it. And everybody could learn it, but it's could versus would. It's the same thing, anybody could, but there's this approach anxiety. Men, it's funny, I was on Dubai radio a year and a half ago or something like that and I was talking to the lady. I said, most, and you know this, you're, you've, how long have you been down doing boxing for? Uh, it's been like two years. Okay, awesome. So you know that in the beginning, most men think they're good at fighting and they think they're good at talking to women. But put a pair of boxing gloves on them and you're like, oh shit, reality is very different. Same in jiu-jitsu. You get choked, you're like, oh, you get confronted with reality. You know, I actually saw um, this old video of Joe Rogan getting his black belt in jiu-jitsu where he talks exactly about that. You get confronted with the reality. You get humbled. The same thing when you do an approach. Go do the approach. What do most men do? Well, no, she's standing there with a the guy. Uh, she has her headphones in. She looks too busy. Busy. What are people gonna think of me? What if she rejects me? No! You just haven't mastered the skill set. You have approach anxiety, fear works like an invisible wall, and you haven't progressively desensitized yourself to the fear. But you have to understand that it's a thing. It's an issue that's there currently. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. Go through it, progressively desensitize yourself to it. And then you can walk around and create dates and relationships out of nothingness. And this is not so you can just keep fucking women forever. No, you wanna be in a relationship. But if you're in a relationship after having gone through that process, you will never have the same level of fear. Fernanda and I, we met three and a half, almost four years ago. We got engaged nine months ago. Am I, and that relationship's on a completely different level. Am I afraid of losing her? In a sense, of course, we're afraid to lose our male friends, our family members, everybody we love. But with my ex-wife, I had panic level fears. Cause like, I'll never find someone like her. And men have that to varying degrees where they, they may not feel the panic consciously or the anxiety, but it's there because they shift their behavior. My uncle always called it a foul compromise. When you're doing things you don't feel like doing, women do that sometimes too, because you feel like you're dependent on that person to meet your need for love and connection. Tony Robbins says, we as human beings are gonna sacrifice our values to meet our need. My value might mean I wanna be respected, I wanna have freedom, I wanna have autonomy, but my need is love and connection. And if I feel that you're predominantly need, meeting my need for love and connection unconsciously, then I don't wanna lose that because it threatens my whole psychological stability. Oh, there's a lot there, man. You know, and you're right. Most men, I struggled with this a lot in the beginning, when I was, especially when I was younger, is approaching women cold. You know, when yeah. you're you're going out, and this is before the internet, you really had no way to approach women yeah. other than you know going up to them and talking to them, especially before social media. Social media, it's made it easier for you know a lot of guys where you can attract, but there's still skill and be able to go up at a, you know whether at a restaurant or bar and approach. And most men are scared of rejection. They're scared of being born and putting mm -hmm. themselves out there. And I love what you said about just going through the process because it is, it's a life hack being able to mm -hmm. approach people cold and build a relationship and it helps in business, networking, et cetera. But how do you, do, like for the types of clients you work with, how do you get them to do that? Do you, yeah. like, is it like, do you give them like a task for like, hey, go talk? Because like, I'm certain there's like a certain <clears throat> level of fear and pushback that they might have. Yeah. So what anybody can do is what's uncomfortable, what nobody can do, is what's overwhelming. And so we've all heard of the comfort zone, doing the things we already know we're good at, you feel comfortable. Then if we do something that's a little bit more difficult, that's challenging, then we're in the zone of challenge or growth, where we have, our heart might be beating, we might be nervous, but we're still able to do it. Then if we do something that's more difficult than that, we get into the zone of overwhelm where there's so much cortisol and adrenaline in our brain, we're like, ah, we freeze. And I've seen this with guys when we do live events or like, or like, like seeing guys freeze up. And I know what that's like at the beginning where like, I wanna go and approach and I just can't, it's too much. So what you do, and I get it, but you go step by step by step. So for example, the most difficult thing, if we imagine a pyramid, the most difficult thing for men to do is probably to see a group of women walk up to them and say, excuse me guys, don't mean to interrupt girls night out, but you are really cute. I wanted to come meet you. What's your name? That is probably the most terrifying thing. Then you go one step below that. What's less difficult? Okay, maybe two women. Okay, plus 
an expression of intention. Okay, what's a little bit less difficult? One woman. But that's still pretty difficult for a man to see a woman in an everyday scenario during the day or at night. For some it's more difficult during the day, for some it's more difficult at night, whatever the case may be. Excuse me two seconds, I saw you really cute, I had to come and say hi. Still difficult. Okay, what can we do that's easier? One level, and there's several levels below. Well, what you could do is you could walk up to her and give her a compliment but not ask for the number in the end. Okay, what's even easier. Well, you could walk up to her and just have an indirect conversation opener where you talk about, excuse me, did you just see that? What? Well, that street musician was amazing. Okay, and then you have a normal conversation. And then even one level below where for you, and there's many more steps in between or a variety of ones. Everybody should create their own pyramid, right? Because it's a little bit subjective. But one thing you can just start doing with is walking through the street and literally just saying, hi, as you're walking by. That's gonna make plenty of people nervous. But if you do, and then one thing above that is you simply ask for directions. You ask, excuse me two seconds, I saw you. And a client of mine is in Malaga right now. And uh, he works for an IT company. And he, I, I was talking to him on the phone. And he says, okay, cool. I wasn't, he wasn't able to do the, excuse me two seconds, you're really cute. But he was like, eh, you can play the tourist. You know, like, eh, how do I get there? And then he builds a little bit of intent and then he asks for the number, right? So he, he's done those. And then the next step is, excuse me two seconds, I saw you really cute, I had to come and say hi. The fear, we all have fear until we don't have it, you know? So you go one step at a time. Everybody can ask for directions. And if you can't ask an attractive woman for directions, ask, somebody who you subjectively perceive to not be so attractive. <laughs> and then below that is you ask a dude, you know, for directions. Okay, you ask the man. Okay, well then you ask a not so attractive woman. Then you ask an attractive woman for directions. Then you ask an attractive woman for directions and you continue the conversation. Then you ask an attractive woman for directions, you continue the conversation and then you ask for Instagram, you know, and then you build it. And it always works, but you can't think yourself into that. You actually have to do it. Because if you actually ask, 10 women for the number after you've asked for directions, you have now progressively desensitized, desensitized yourself. Because your brain thinks you're gonna die if you approach a woman. Because your brain doesn't want change. You'd rather stay in your misery but survive. Tony Robbins says your brain's job is to help you survive. It's not to make you happy. And even if you're gonna be unhappy, at least you live. That's what your DNA wants to do to you. It's your job to make you happy, so to push through that fear. But we can, and this is one of the most important things, that fear works like an invisible wall. And whenever we're afraid of something, we don't, if it's not something stupid, right? If it's something that we know we should be doing, that's good for us, that's good for humanity, if it's done in a kind of respectful way, and we don't do it, the wall strengthens a little bit. The wall strengthens a little bit. The wall strengthens a little bit. It gets more and more difficult. But if you see the fear, BAM! And you just go right through it, and you do that over and over again, you actually create freedom for yourself in terms of your own expression. And you don't just leave your comfort zone, you actually expand your comfort zone. Because what, what, because what was outside of your comfort zone at one point is now part of your comfort zone. Oh, that is good. That, that is so good. You know, stepping outside your comfort zone and, and public speaking, getting rejected, all these things that test us, you know, even not just guys, even like mm. women too. It's just, for, it's, we're all in, in our comfort zone. And for men, dealing with women is the scariest thing. I mm. want to ask something and I'm going to ask it and I, I hate to do this on the show, but I'm going to do it. Anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I haven't shown I've always felt <clears throat> lucky because I've always attracted chicks and I, I hate to say it this way, but I have to, you know, keep it real. <laughs> But I've wondered for men, you know, if you have, if you feel as if you're not good looking enough mm -hmm. and you have these, cause it's hard. Cause I feel like women are very critical and women have their type and not critical. Everybody, we're all selective, right? Now do the men that you work with is, do they have to kind of mask, if they have like these insecurities, how do they go around them? Yeah. So basically what you're asking for is how to build confidence. Yeah, confidence. You know, so let's just say like if you're a guy and you're like, man, this is, <clears throat> she's beautiful. And then you're kind of like, hey, why would she go out with me? Yeah. So because confidence is the opposite of insecurity, right? Yeah, yeah. Totally. So yeah, yeah. basically what you do is build confidence and to get over those insecurities. The way you build confidence is there's three different, there's multiple, but like there's three main sources. One is competence. The better you get at something, the more you know the how, the more you put yourself out there, the more you take action, the more confident you get. The more, the more you, the more you advance in jujitsu, first six months suck. You get choked, choked, choked. You choke the first guy, you're like, boom, winner effect. Your testosterone goes up, you get hooked, right? Same in boxing. Yeah. You, the first time, boom, you dodge a punch, you're like, whoa, this was sick. You know, and the first time you land a punch, you're like, oh, that was kind of oddly satisfying. <laughs> so you develop a competence. 
by taking action, getting strategies, and you can learn that yourself, you can get mentors, you can use free resources, right? But you develop a competence, that's one. Competence creates confidence. Then the next one is state, your mental and emotional state. And we have to understand that our neurochemistry has an impact on our, le on our daily levels of confidence. Because why do some days we feel more confident and others not? You're not the same person before or after a workout. After a workout, you're a different person because your testosterone has in in been increased. A bunch of neurotransmitters in your brain. So there's a lot of techniques. And I learned a lot from a guy in Germany called Gunther Schmidt, who was a direct student of Milton Erickson. I don't know, have you heard of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming? I've heard of it, I don't know in detail, but I've heard of it, yeah. It's a, it's a personal development system. It's a goal setting system. There is hypnosis elements in it. The two founders, they learned a lot from a guy called Milton Erickson, who, who was a genius, who was considered an icon, who founded hypnotherapy back in the day. Um, and so these guys learned from him. And then there's a guy in Germany who's probably one of Germany's highly regarded psychologists. There's a lot, but like he's, he's an amazing. He's also in his 70s right now. He was a direct student of Milton Erickson back in the day. And Tony Robbins, for example, he learned from the two founders of NLP, J just nerding out about the history a little bit. And so this guy, he created something called hypnosystemic therapy because hypnotherapy is this idea that there's a lot of elements on the inside that control how we feel. Because it's not just the outside. Whether something happens, why are there some people who have one terrible event happen to them? You go on a date, it doesn't go well, some people crawl back in their shell, they jerk themselves to sleep, fall asleep with jizz on their hand, and wake up the next morning and feel depressed. Why are there some people who say, get out there again, do another couple approach. Where's the difference? your internal representations, your state, your mental and emotional state. And there's different models. One model, Tony Robbins says, there's our language patterns, our focus, and our physiology that influence how we feel. And our Gunter Schmidt also talks about that. We have patterns of focus. So for example, if we ask ourselves, what if she rejects me, and we focus on what if, and something that's outside of our control, it's gonna create anxiety, because our brain is trying to solve it. Okay, but if I ask myself, what can I control right now? What's the only thing I can control? well, my state and my actions, but I can't control her reaction. I can't control that. That's outside of my immediate realm of control. Okay, cool. Well, then I can relax a little bit. So often we stress because we don't have clarity on what we can actually control as opposed to what we can't control. Because that's one. And then it's also our language patterns. How do we talk to ourselves? So many men, high achievers, ambitious men, they have a really harsh inner dialogue. And a little bit of that is fine because it's got, you know, come, don't be a bitch, let's go, boom, what are you doing? <laughs> and a lot of that is good. But there's a point where it is like a bell curve where it doesn't become useful. Imagine like a bell curve. If I have zero negative dialogue, if I have zero dissatisfaction, part of that comes from our own dialogue, I have zero motivation to change. So a little bit gets me to take action, but too much of it, boom, and I crash. Because some called the formula of change. The more dissatisfaction I feel with my current situation, the more I'm willing to change, right? Pain and pleasure motivation. But this is something that I've learned from Gunther Schmidt, which is, yes, more dissatisfaction increases your willingness to change, but not necessarily your own experience of competence. We've all felt pretty shit about situations, but somehow still unable to change it. Why is that? Well, because if it's too much, my willingness goes up, but my sense of competence decreases. So I need to have a higher willingness to change, but I also need to feel competent. So what we want is we want more towards motivation than away from motivation because it diminishes our own sense of competence. So how will you speak to yourself? That's why books like The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon are so key. You have to refuse to live in an adversarial relationship with yourself. You have to be your own biggest fan. You have to have men around you who tell you you're awesome. Jordan Peterson talks about that. What's a good friend? Well, he's happy for you to win. Right? Re hey, I, I got this win. We're like, fucking awesome. Even if you could see he's had a rough day and he doesn't feel any positivity within him today, you won. He says, bro, fucking awesome. I'm genuinely happy for you. That's a good friend. And so you need to discipline your own inner dialogue. And some of that meditation can help because we're so identified with the negative thoughts. And the really only thing that makes us suffer is thoughts we believe. So inner dialogue. And the third component is physiology and how we walk our body language, how we breathe, Wim Hof, because they directly impact our neurochemistry. So that's the second source of competence, the first, uh, sorry, of confidence. The first source was competence, the second one was mental and emotional state. And then the third one is osmosis. Simply by spending time around people who are confident, you become more confident. You can't help it. 
and I believe there are studies, I don't know the science on it, that indicate that by being around other men who compete or by being around other high testosterone men, your testosterone actually increases. That's why we as, let me tell you something. So me and my friends, we did this Red Bull race here in Ireland. They organized, it's a big promotion event. It's like hell and back, but like a, like a easier version of it. You go through the mud and all that. So four or five of my friends, we did it. We drove two and a half hours into the countryside in Ireland. They did it in the middle of fucking nowhere, right? So it was a rainy day, it was all muddy. We did it, it was great, busted up knees. Told, I'll show you the picture maybe at some point. <laughs> And then, by the end of it, they had showers. Man, it looked like a fucking concentration camp, these showers. It was ridiculous. But what was so cool, there was a bunch of guys, just in underwear, muddy, standing around. Everybody was happy because it was just a bunch of men doing manly things and competing, waiting to get their showers. Everybody was happy. Nobody was depressed in that moment. Why? One, you physically exerted yourself, you got sunlight, you breathed, and you were around a bunch of other men. High quality male friends is one of the most important sources of happiness, stability, mental and physical health that people can have. For women as well, women need to have women around them, men need to have men around them. It is one of the most important things. Jiu Jitsu, boxing, so great. Yeah, you're gonna meet a bunch of dickheads, but you're gonna meet some really, really good guys. It's one of the most important things that I'm trying to help people with. Most of my clients, especially the more successful they get, the less high quality male friends they have. I mean, they may have some that live in other states far away, but locally. I see my friends every week. I need to see them every week, right? And I believe everybody needs that. Now here's the introverts who think, oh, I'm introverted, I don't need it. Andrew Huberman says the only scientifically documented difference between introverts and extroverts is that introverts get more dopamine from social interactions than extroverts, which means they need less and they satiate quicker, but everybody needs it. A couple of hundred thousand years ago, when our brain was shaped into its current form, we had people around us 24 seven, our little tribe of 50, 100 people. I'm an introvert, I'm a loner. No, that means your tribe is 50 meters over there and you're chilling in the corner eating leaves or some shit. But you're still with your tribe, it's still there. And we unconsciously learned that the people who were sent into exile and away from the tribe, because they didn't behave the way their tribe wanted to, which is where your fear of rejection comes from, by the way, they died because they missed out on protection from the tribe, so they got attacked, they starved, or at the very least, they lost their chance to pass on the genetic legacy to the female members of the tribe. So we learned that if I'm away from the tribe, I'll, I might die. So our brain immediately increases cortisol and anxiety if we're isolated. There's a beautiful book which I recommend to everybody, which is called Lost Connections by Joanne Hari, The Real Causes for Anxiety and Depression. And you don't have to be depressed to read it, but it'll really teach you a lot about happiness. And one of the biggest sources of unhappiness is a lack of high quality social contact. Simply by being around people you love and trust, your brain releases oxytocin. Hug your friends, man. Hug your friends. The reason people feel shit is not by accident. There's very systematic things. And this is coming back to what Gunter Schmidt does. It's not just hypno, the internal component, there's also a systematic component. If your life isn't set up in a way where it makes you happy, because you even should sleep, exercise, social contact, well, it's gonna fuck you up simply by being around your friends, by hugging them, zoom, oxytocin. You get happy and healthy by being around good people. Sorry, I went on a bit of a rant there. <laughs> No, no, no. It's real because you're right. Like a lot of guys, especially as you progress, you know, when guys get older, we tend to isolate. You know, we lose our social. And women don't. Women can keep their social circles a lot more. You know, and there's some guys that do, but for the most part, a lot of guys tend to isolate as they get older. They have family responsibility. Yeah. And it also seems a lot of your work is confidence building. And that's kind of the main thing I'm getting to. And I, I frequently talk about that on the show because the confidence in business and life, it really is the key differentiator between people, that, that, that inner dialogue that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have these you know, different projections that come externally and then people beat themselves up way too much and it's one of the most frequent things I see with either entrepreneurs, but especially in dating. And, the, and it comes across as you talk to women, like the number one thing you hear from women today is, they want somebody ambitious and with confidence. Yeah. It's, these are the top things you hear frequently. I agree. Another thing too is you talk a lot about women testing men in subtle ways. <laughs> can, can you share a little bit about this? How, how do yeah. women test us bros out? Uh, in many different ways. Um, do you want to give me a scenario and then I, because there's so many. If, any any, any thing, context. You know, like, well, let's talk about first dates. Cause man, sure. I, like on my Instagram anytime, and I'm sure after I post this show, I'm gonna get 50 to 100 messages from women. <laughs> women hate dating today. Mm. At least, not all, but there's a high percentage. I've never seen anything like it. And as a businessman, 
In my day world, I'm in the technology space. So okay. this is completely on my realm. So when I go on these dates and I you know, post content, I hear from women frequently that they're tired. They, they're just done with dating. They hate the, for the dating process. Guys do not know how to date. Guys want to do coffee. They don't want to take them out to a fancy place. When they go out to, to a fancy place or to a nice place, guys are you know, boring, uptight. They have no idea how to date. And women are just saying, I'm actually better off alone than with a guy. Yeah. So when we're on a first date, you know, how does, what's a win for men on a first date? Sorry, what's a win or what did you... Or, yeah, yeah, how does it, like, yeah, what's a okay. win and how are women yeah. testing us guys out yeah. on these dates? So let, let me address the test thing first. So first of all, there's something called congruence tests, which is basically a women consciously or unconsciously exerting behaviors that make sure that you're a man of integrity and true confidence and options. That's one. I'll give you a couple of practical examples in a minute. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. The wrong way, every woman will test you. The wrong women will test you way too much. Because some people, and this is where it goes to pick up, it's like, doesn't matter how many congruent tests she throws at me, I'll pass them all and eventually I'll get into her pants. That's not what I want because, yeah, you can do that, but like, what good is that? But every woman will test you at some point. So she might test you by bringing up her ex. And again, this may be a red flag, but it, it, it may be congruent tests or it may just be a natural part of the conversation also, you know? Because sometimes people talk about their past. Just because she brings up her ex in one side sentence, that's not... You know, the devil is in the detail a little bit. But if she talks about her ex, most men make one of the two following mistakes. They either talk bad about the guy or they get on his side. If you talk about other men on a first date, you lose because there's no way you're going to win. There's certain roles. My role is to care about men. I care about women equally, but like I'm just working with men. So it's not like I'm, I don't have this. That's one of the things that's wrong with society right now. It's like men against women. No, we're together, right? Just because you're empowering one side doesn't mean you're disempowering the other, right? It's fundamentally both. So, but if you talk about other men on a date and you talk bad about the guy, you seem try hard and insecure and like a fucking white knight, right? If you talk good about the guy, it looks like you're sucking his dick and you're a little bitch. That doesn't help either, you know? So, but don't go into it. Or you're just like so aggrieved, you're like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Or you go into the role of the psychotherapist, then the date gets heavy. She experiences negative emotions unconsciously. She realizes the delta in her emotions. In the beginning, I felt okay. Then it got real heavy. Oh, I don't know, I thought the date went well. We got these deep and meaningful conversations, but she never wanted to meet for a second. And she got busy. She wanted to focus on herself. Yeah, well, maybe that may be one of the reasons. So if she brings up her ex-boyfriend, for example, let's role play this just for one sec. Let's, let's say you're the girl. <laughs> And just bring up the ex-boyfriend in one scenario. I'll show you a good way for the guys how they can respond to that in a respectful yet fun way. Sure. Uh, yeah. So we're on a date, and yeah, you know, one of the things about my ex, I used to. He he was actually really good with money. He used to uh, take me out. He used to, you know, he was really good, but emotionally he wasn't there for me. Okay. Yeah. No, sorry to hear that. So anyway, you were saying you're really into skiing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love skiing. Yeah, yeah, me too. I like skiing more, so I want to... Uh, boom, calm. Okay, cool. Anyway, okay, cool. No, I'm sorry. Empathetic? Anyway, moving on immediately. She'll get the message. I won't be talking to you about your ex on the date. Why would I? You crazy? Why would I? Why would I entertain another man on the date? This is about me and you. And you see a lot of men make this. They'll kind of go on and dive deep and they'll just keep going. And going because and going. they're kind guys and we're all, like most guys, there's some psychopaths and narcissists who are just like, they don't come to me, right? The guys are going to be, they're genuinely nice people. Um, or, is most your, is most your, like, do women listen to your content? And if they do, what could, do you get hate mail from women? Very little. I, no, genuinely. Every now and then, of course. But very little. Some women listen to it and some say, well, this is amazing. Do you also work with women? And I have worked with women in the past. It's mainly with no men, way. though. I get shocked. What, what, what do they say? Like, what, like, what woman for coaching? They would want to... Yeah, coach. they want... Like, I've worked with women. They, they come to me for coaching sometimes, yeah? Wow, wow. Oh, yeah. Because... But I think they see my intent. Am I perfect? No. But I think intent really comes through. What's your in intent? The truth will show in the end. At some point. Play it over 10 years, 20 years, truth will come out. And I think my I think they feel that... Now, I say things that are provocative. Sometimes they're just like, nah, mm. they complain they, in the comments. Sometimes I don't even read the comments anymore. You know, they, da, da, da. I was just like, but men as well. I, I don't see there's more negativity coming from one side if I do say something provocative. For example, there was a thing where Fernanda, we played the scenario on a reel. It was like when she asked you, so how many girls have you, how many women have you been with? Well, I'm actually a, a virgin, but I promise I learn fast, you know? It's like, nah, nah. It's, like, it's a joke. 
but it's actually a good answer, you know? And then we can talk about the psychology there. But I think they feel that I, there's a lot of people who have, and I'm not in the business of talking bad about anybody. I'm not interested in that ever. You will never see me. I'm not interested in debates. I am not interested in talking bad about people. Not my thing. People can do whatever they want. And I, I appreciate people who have debates. That's good. They have to be had, not for me. Thank you. Um, but there are some people who have, you can feel they have a bit of hate for women. Holy shit. Especially in yeah, this, yeah, yeah. in certain spaces. Um, I don't have that. Are there some women who are going to destroy your life as a man? For sure. Are there some men who are going to destroy your life? For sure. If you hate on any particular group of people, you're confused. Or rather, you have unhealed trauma, which is actually understandable because this is what really happens. The reason people hate on any particular group of people is because they made a painful experience in the past and they do what human beings do. They generalize. But the problem is you miss out on so much beauty and it's very important to, to heal that. And, you know, because men make really, if a man is in a relationship with a woman, he's always loyal and then she go and cheats on him and then she takes half of his shit, it's very understandable that you become nihilistic, 100%. And how would I ever trust a woman? Well, how do you trust a woman? You make sure that you screen, first of all, you evaluate a lot of options, you find somebody, you learn to read red flags, so you minimize the possibility to as close, it's never going to be zero, to as close to zero as possible. And then you just know that if it happens, it's okay. But there are, this is what people don't understand, is there's some women who will never cheat. They just won't. People say all women will cheat. No, that's not true. Out of 4 billion women, really all would cheat? No, that's not true. There's some, even if it's just like tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. Most, but there's some women who will cheat for sure, just like with men, and some are kind of like under the right circumstances. But there are some women who are way more likely than, other, than others. And find some who just have a, a history of never doing that. And so, but how can we believe they say the truth? Well, if you believe that everybody lies to you all the time, that's a very nihilistic way. No, you're not supposed to be stupid. You got to think critically. But what happens is we want to protect ourselves. So we build these walls around our heart. And the problem is we don't just keep the pain out, but you also keep love out. And the biggest source of joy is love, be that with men, with women. And I think that's really what heals it in the end. And you've got to be willing to get hurt. And you're going to have moments where you're just like, fuck, it hurts so bad, I can't do this anymore. And then you just go and you meditate, you go to the gym, you roll, you change your state, you do a fucking ice bath. You, and then you just need one positive example to the contrary because there's always people in this world worth fighting for. There's people who will disappoint you, but there's people who are really like worth doing beautiful things for, you know? Oh yeah, totally, yeah. And, and I see that too a lot, man. Like I see, like there's this sentiment for a lot of like guys that they are just, have this hatred of women today. And also vice versa. Like, there's also a lot of women who are just tired of like, yeah. a lot too. The other side, like, it, so and I'm always curious about this issue. I'm like, you know, it, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand it. But if you look at the, even the top rated shows today, like a lot of the top rated shows, they have that divisive content where yeah. it's women against guys, guys complaining against girls. I mean, against women, and it's um, it's pretty intense to see. But to your point, like, it's a lot of it's just unhealed trauma. You know, trauma is a big word now. Everybody is. You know, I think with social media and just the amount of options that certain people have. Go ahead, what were you going to say? So, sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I have one no, important no. thing to share on trauma. And I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm not even a fucking scientist. I'm a dating coach for fuck's sake, okay? So don't listen to anything I say. But, <laughs> uh, but here's something that I've learned again from some psychologists in Germany, which is a lot of people like to, and first of all, Trauma is very real. People have very, very horrible things that happen to them. Do EMD or therapy. Do meditation. Seek out all the amazing therapists. And one thing to keep in mind with therapists, most people are at the bottom. Most people suck. Most, yeah. in anything, most people fucking suck. So, oh, I tried therapy. You were with a fucking shitty therapist. Find a good one. You might have to be willing to go through five, six, seven therapists until you find one that works. So therapy does not equal therapy and psychologist doesn't equal psychotherapist. So be willing, if, you, if anybody has an issue right now, try seven to 10 different ones. So that's one. Um, where the fuck was I going with this? Yeah, so a lot of, so people have difficult things happen to them, but a lot of people use trauma as an excuse as to why they're experiencing undesirable emotional states in the present. And 
It's very easy to disprove that trauma is really at the cause of anything you have nowadays because there's no clear cause and effect relationship between trauma and something you have today. Well, because something happened bad in the past, I am now depressed, I'm now anxious, or I'm insecure around women. Because I got rejected when I was 17, I'm now a 44 year old guy and I'm socially awkward. No, that's not true. Why isn't that true? Because if that was true, if there was such a clear cause and effect relationship between the traumatic event and the effect, as in you being socially awkward right now, or just not being good with women, that would mean that as long as the cause stays the same, the effect stays the same. But you can't change the cause. So that would mean that you're always, throughout the whole 20, last 20, 30 years, you're always equally shy and insecure. Well, that isn't true, is it? Haven't you had at least moments where you felt confident, where you felt in the flow? Ah, oh, interesting. So what is it really? So evidently our nervous, everybody has the competencies within them to become confident. That's what I was saying, it's a, com it's a state. You can access confidence right now if you ask yourself with a little bit of hypnosis, with just changing your focus, remembering moments that, where you already performed well, you can prime, it's called priming, a more resourceful mental and emotional state. So most, and again, do trauma is still real, but more often than not what hinders people right now, what makes people unhappy right now, isolated or just not, not competent in a so, certain realm, is unmet needs. You don't have needs that are being met. Oh, I'm not feeling good right now. Oh, is it because something happened to you 17 years ago or because you had five hours of social contact last week and you worked out only once and you didn't get sunlight. It's much more your physiological as well as your psychological needs right now that determine your well-being and your competence. It's, is it maybe because you didn't do any approach ever? You didn't go through progressive desensitization? It's unmet psychological needs right now, more so than trauma. So never fucking use trauma as an excuse. Yes, we have to address and accept that it's very real and very appreciate that there's horrible things that happen to people and you have to be very appreciative of the things that happen to people at the same time for yourself as an individual. Never use it as an excuse ever fulfill your needs right now your psychological and physiological needs and you'll be able to do whatever the fuck you want that, that is so real that that is so real and, and many of us today use that as an excuse use our past use what happened to us yeah. we put ourselves in these boxes and then we can't get ourselves out of them and as you go into the world to your point especially when you go out and you're trying to meet your yeah. and it kind of ties to what you were saying in the beginning with most men is a lot of times we get the woman or a partner for a certain version of ourselves, and as we grow and evolve and we change yeah. a lot of times it's not that we're necessarily settling but it may be that you're just you just took the person that was right for you at a right time and you've yeah. grown and changed out of it yeah um so l let's talk about this next thing you, you know like for dating let's talk about practical dating tips for guys so yes guys go out they're talking to somebody um how do you know whether she's interested or not interested um, in a daytime approach scenario on the date or during a nighttime approach scenario? During, first of all, during the date and then post okay. date. Okay, so first of all, let me just, because I have one meeting starting in three minutes, but I can delay okay. that. Okay. Just let me just send one quick text here, two seconds. Okay. Okay, so during the, my apologies. Um, so during the date, <clears throat> you should assume she's interested until she gives you evidence to the contrary. Now, let's define that, put that in context. That does not mean that you're allowed to do anything disrespectful, that you're allowed to make any advances that are not consensual. Not at all. That's not what that means. But internally, most men assume they have to prove something for her to be interested. She's on a date with you, motherfucker. She's already there. So your mindset on the date, overall as a man, you have to improve your communication skills to perform well. Yes, that's a skill set, you gotta do that. But the only thought you should have the date on the date is, of course she wants me. There's nothing in the world that I can do to fuck this up if it's meant to be. And if it's not meant to be, there's nothing in the world I can do to make it work. So let just assume she's interested. now. You gotta be respectful, especially when it comes to building physicality, very slowly, very respectfully, and always. But internally, you assume, of course she's interested in me. Because if you assume she's not, and you're constantly looking for signs, you're just like, did she, did she turn her head? She look at me, she's smiling. If you look for all, yes, there are certain 
indicators of interest, and I can list a few here, absolutely. You're, the most important thing is that you assume she's interested. Because why should she be there? She lives in a free country. She has the right to leave at any point in time. She could be doing anything else with her time rather than spend time with your ass right now. So it's like, <laughs> you know, so that's important. So now there are a couple of clear indicators. If she asks you a question, that's a good sign. If she laughs about your jokes, especially if you know whether it actually wasn't that funny and she laughs about it, that's good. If she's not asking questions back, she's not laughing, she's not emotionally engaged, she has a stoic face, that's not a great sign. Is she initiating, if she's initiating physical contact herself, that's a fantastic sign. So you wanna read her signals. So you always wanna ping off of her and see how she's reacting. You're always gonna receive one of three different types of signals, a positive, a neutral, or a negative. Ooh, that, that is good. And look, I know we're hitting up time, so I, I wanna close on just be respectful of time, but I do, I do I definitely wanna have Oh, actually, so, sorry, so, so, sorry. I just got a, yeah. the, the meeting that uh, I was supposed to have. The, the other person just said is, um, so it just got canceled. So yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Yeah, let, let, yeah. Let's keep going. Like, you know, this, this this topic in particular, man. Women are gonna love this. Men are gonna love this because it, it particularly in like the the early stages scenarios, man. Uh, how, how much time do you have? Do you have like another? I time? I was supposed to have an hour long client call, but the client goes, I thought it was next week. So <laughs> some motherfucker. <laughs> I, I have a meeting, like, I should have a meeting start, but I, I can run for 15 minutes. I already let him know. Absolutely, so let, of let's course. Let's keep rolling. So let, let's talk about, uh, you know, on, on, in the beginning stages, because I feel like this is where a lot of guys lose the woman in the scenario. Mm. Is there, they miss cues, they're not sure, you know, how quickly to text after. And this is for all, uh, uh, this is for all men. I have friends, and I put myself in this category, I don't necessarily, I only go out now at this point in my life with women that I've attracted. And I chase when I need to chase. There's women I would pursue, but there's also, I, I do a good job attracting at this stage of my life. But there is a portion of when you try to convert somebody that you want, she's not interested in you, you convince her to go on a date. And it's that, you know, it's that tough dance where you're trying, you're almost trying to come, you're coming at in the negative and you're trying to come out in the situation positive. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean? And, and, and so, what's your question? So how do guys, one, on a date, dating scenario, how quickly do you wait to text the person back? Great question. Uh, the same evening. So regardless of whether or not she went home with you that evening, you should send her a text saying 15 minutes after the date saying, or like, hope you got home safe, was fun hanging out with you. These two texts, guys, copy this, steal this, okay? Was fun, hope you got home safe, and then was fun spending time, was fun hanging out. Just these two texts, that's it. Not more, not less, not three days later. There's a whole bunch of psychology that goes into that. Just trust me on this, these two texts. Then she's gonna, if she had a good time, she's gonna say, yes, thanks so much, me too. Then the next message is gonna be, let's meet for drinks one of these days. And you immediately go for the close for the second date. That's it. Okay, good, good. Now, here's another question. Sliding into DMs. Do you recommend it for men? Oh yeah, but yes, the success rate of sliding, I, I, I don't like the term because it sounds sleazy as shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it, it, it's like, I prefer cold outreach on Instagram. Cold outreach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and you recommend it. You, you oh think yeah. It works. Oh, it's amazing. I've had clients who got four to five dates a week. They only use that because we teach that in a program as well. <laughs> just that, just from, it's not necessary to get that much to find a relationship, but of course, the success rate of that, one depends obviously on the text, but 80, 90% of the success rate, 90% of the success depends on the strength of your Instagram profile. Ooh, okay. And anybody can build a great Instagram profile. This is not about posing in front of somebody's car. It's like, look at my watch, you know? It's not that, <laughs> but it's, if you do jujitsu, so, now, this, you doing jujitsu, a picture of you being in a certain jujitsu pose and you can look like a bitch. A different pose, you can look amazing. Okay, you know that, right? Certain poses just look great, certain don't. On the, I, I had a client, he's, he's really in good shape, but the pictures he posted of himself in the gym, he's really jacked and he looks really good and he's intelligent and he's a business owner, amazing. He made himself look so skinny somehow. I was like, how were you, and he did some, so do a triceps pull down if you're in the gym. Don't do a weird, where you're, you know, so it depends a little bit on the picture. 
Social proof, lifestyle, things that boost your status, the pictures you're tagged in. You gotta post Instagram stories because then you're staying top of mind and you can, the probability should show up to the second date is a lot higher, the probability should show up to the first date is also a lot higher because there's so many more attractive things you can see about you. But yeah, reaching out to women in a respectful way on Instagram, not sending dick pics is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, man. And I feel like a lot, a lot of guys dismiss the importance of, you know, branding online, social media and attracting, you know, how to attract yeah. the right woman and the opportunities because with the strong online profile, you can really attract a lot of things into your life, but you have to do it in a tasteful way that is not yeah. so easy. Yeah. To your point, it doesn't make you look like an F-boy because that's the other side too from, you hear from a lot of women is <clears throat> the guys that have a lot of confidence and that have like their pages and their profiles, they automatically assume this guy's a sleazy F-boy player. Yeah, but there you can then send a voice message, for example. Now, for most people, I don't recommend voice messages. Most men, please hear me, don't send voice messages because you're gonna mess it up. There's way more, the, the mar, like, may, way more potential for error when you send a voice message, okay? So just stick with texting for most people, but if you're good at it, like, like for example, you got a really good voice. For you, boom, voice messages, bam, very comforting. Because there's two things women want. They want attraction and they want trust. So if somebody comes across as a fuckboy, they're lacking trust and comfort. Most men is the opposite. They have a lot of trust with women. That's why they get friends on, but they don't have a lot of attraction. So in your conversation with women, you either need to build attraction or trust. Ooh, that's, that's good. And, and you know, friend zoning. <clears throat> how, do you, how do guys know when they've been friend zoned? And if you are friend zoned, yeah. can you work your way out of it? Yeah, you just don't get friend zoned. The friend zone is an offer she makes you. You don't have to accept it. <laughs> She could say, we're gonna be friends. No, we're not. Remember the scene from Wolf of Wall Street? You and I, we're gonna be friends. You and I were never gonna be just friends. You can literally just say that. You and I were never gonna be just friends. Now, the friend zone oftentimes is a hidden rejection and that's fine. Anybody gets rejected. Anybody who puts themselves out there in any realm of human endeavor gets rejected, which is perfectly fine. Now, in the beginning, your brain thinks you're gonna die when you get rejected until you progressively desensitize yourself to it. But you just don't accept the frame of the friend zone. You're gonna tell her in a very kind way, well, if we're gonna move things forward, it's gonna be in a romantic man-to-woman frame. If you don't want that, no problem at all. I wish you all the best. Not a bother. I'm not gonna be dick about it. I'm gonna be cool. I can still be or like, it doesn't mean I can't be, doesn't mean you can't have friendships with women, right? There's some people say men and women can't be friends. You can. Still, at the same time, 99% of men who are friends with women are trying to fuck them, okay? So, you can have friend, a friendship with a woman if either you're not attracted to her or you're truly satisfied. Most men, they're just waiting somewhere and they're waiting to strike like a snake with the second she breaks up with her current dude, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you're right, man. You're right. I, you know, I, I, I agree with that point of view. A, a lot of women disagree with that. You know, a lot of women really believe it. But I, I think deep down for a lot of guys, especially depending on the attractiveness of the woman, the guys are, you know, they have these labels like male or bitter. It's the kind of guys just kind of hanging, lingering around and waiting for the right opportunity. So it, it, here's another thing for guys. How do guys who are very confident and who have a strong brand and I'm certain that you, know, you must work with these guys too. How do they not come across as an F-boy or sleazy? Yeah, so most of the people who come to me, they don't really have that issue. It's like, they don't have that issue. no, no, they're the opposite. They're the typical nice guys, you know? I, do give, I will give you a piece of advice for that, but so the way you don't do that is you just emphasize trust and comfort in your communication. But first of all, like if you are a fuck, the people who come to me, they want to have a relationship, you know? If you yeah, don't yeah. want to come across like a fuckboy, well, then just build more trust and comfort in your communication. Just share things that are, be more vulnerable. That's the advice. Not vulnerable in a weak way. I have a YouTube video on vulnerability that people can watch. It's actually, the background on that video is awesome. It's filmed at the Guinness Lake in Ireland. It's a sick shot. If you put in David Mason vulnerability on YouTube, I have a 16 minute, 10 minute video where I explain vulnerability, which is really cool. But the base idea is, Vulnerability does not mean you get all sad and poopy pants on the date. No, but you genuinely, I'll give you the perfect example that I talk about in the YouTube video as well. A friend of mine, he had a bit of a rough time throughout And so, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that word, my apologies. Um, um, through, uh, sorry. Um, but he had a rough time throughout that time. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. because he was a little bit isolated and stuff. And then he went on a date with a girl and he, with a lady, and he told her about it. He was like, yeah, well, look, it was pretty rough. And there's a couple of things that happened. Now he talked about that for a minute and a half. It wasn't 20 minutes, him putting her in the role of a psychotherapist. He just thought, yeah, I know there were some rough times. It was obviously like I handled it and these were the things I did to take care of it. But that makes, builds trust because what is a fuck boy? Somebody, who, she lacks trust. That's what it means. So when you build trust, you don't come across like a fuck boy. 
Oh, that's that's huge. Yeah, that is huge. Once you once you build trust, and that's actually how shows help me out with this a lot. Is once you build trust, and people really get to know you and they trust you, it's just a totally different experience. Yeah. But a lot of times it's very surface level. You know, sometimes people judge people very surface level. I think a lot of guys do this too with women. You know, when you're going on a date, they automatically assume that she's out of the league. And a lot of women, you know, they're not always attracted to the best looking person. They want to have oh, yeah. somebody they can trust, somebody that makes them feel comfortable. You know, David, I'm getting pinged like hell by my team. So sure. I, I do want to uh, have to run. But I will tell you this, David, I, I really appreciate you coming on, man. I want to have you on again because this has been a master class in how men can attract the right people into their lives, how to, you know, throughout the full cycle from attraction, dating, how do men can be their authentic selves? Because to your point, a lot of men are suffering in silence now, today. And there's the disconnect that there is between, you know, what men want, what women want, and how to bridge that gap. I feel like you're doing an amazing job doing it. I'd love to have you on again, brother. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.